in 2015 in the summer series and good to be back. We had Spencer come over uh, back last month and I, whoop, I didn't break it. Uh, that boy can preach. So yeah, I'm, you guys are blessed to have him. He's, um, but anyway, fight the good fight. I think uh, many of us in here have seen counterfeit money before. Any of y'all ever seen counterfeit money? I'm sure you have. I think, I remember back when, when the new 20s and the new 50s and new 100s came out and uh, people were making counterfeit money and after they came out, many people would, uh, many stores would mark them with a marker to, to see if they were genuine or not. And God expects His children to not be fake. God expects His children to be, to be genuine and to live lives that are not counterfeit. A counterfeit means something that's not real, that's not genuine, okay? It looks like the real thing, but in reality, it's fake and it has no value at all. That's not how we're supposed to live as God's children. There are all kind of counterfeits in the world that we live in, aren't there? There's fake diamonds, right? Women, you, ladies, you never got any fake diamonds before, have you? Or fake gold, or there's fake diplomas. Do you know there's even fake news out there today? I bet y'all hadn't heard anything about that on the news. I've heard people before who claim to be doctors when in reality they were counterfeits. They went to school, but they have they never went to school. They have large offices, and all they care about is making money. I read that there's even counterfeits in ministry. You can fill out a form, send in your money. You can receive a certificate from a church claiming that you're now an ordained minister. Basically nothing but a worthless piece of paper. I even saw on the news recently of a, of, a, of a counterfeit or a fake policeman who tried to pull over someone who was an actual policeman. I would have liked to have seen that. I don't know about you guys. But, uh, but there are many who are fooled by the counterfeits in the world. There are many who live counterfeit lives as Christians, who claim to be Christians. There are many who put up the front saying they are Christians. Yet, and they're here every time the doors open, but from day to day their hearts are far from God. Some you can tell that they are counterfeit by their actions. Jesus said, you can recognize a tree by its fruit. One who lives wicked lives, it'll be evidence in their lives. And those who are striving to live like God, the evidence will be seen as well in their life. The Lord, I mean, the counterfeits will be exposed because many will stand before the Lord in judgment. and He will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Many claim that they knew him, but they're just counterfeits. Now, a genuine and true Christian will not hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. They'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Words I long to hear, and many in here do as well. I want each of us, I don't know very many of you, I know several people, but I want all of us to live confident, faithful lives like the Apostle Paul did. He had his sins like we all do. But he was confident of where he was going to spend eternity when life was over with. So don't be someone who's counterfeit. Be someone who is a committed, dedicated follower of Christ, who fights the good fight of faith. Paul, a genuine servant of Christ, in 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, was nearing the end of his life. Um, now the Bible is silent regarding the death of Paul. Tradition says that Paul was beheaded on the Ostian Road just outside of Rome. Uh, it's been said that Paul was beheaded by Nero in Rome in the great persecution of Christians in, in either AD 67 or 68. But, but he wrote these famous words that you've probably heard many times uh, in, in Bible classes, devotionals, or sermons. But he says in 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also unto all who have loved his appearing. It seems as though Paul is, is, was anticipating his death. It also seems as though Paul was going to, to die blessed or a happy man because of where he was headed. Paul was one who started strong in Christ, but he also finished strong. Story is told of a man who was just tried just about everything he could to help him quit smoking. And, and he ended up trying hypnosis to help him quit. And his friend asked him if he thought hypnosis would help him stop. And his friend said, you know, it's, anything's worth a shot. 
He told his friend that he'd helped him quit the first time he, he tried and he thought it would help him again. Okay? He was able to quit smoking once before, but he ended up picking up this nasty habit again. It's easy to start something, isn't it? I'm good at starting a book, maybe reading a chapter or two. My family and I went to Oklahoma City last week just for a little short uh, vacation, and Garth Brooks was out there too. But uh, um, I took a book, an easy-to-read Max Licato, just like Jesus' book. I read the first chapter. I said, well, let's skip to the end, and then I'll read the in-between. Yeah, I haven't picked up the in-between part yet. Um, Many are good at starting something like a diet, or I, I'm really good at starting a low-carb diet for about three days. Anybody in here with me on that? No? No. You don't even start them? All right, I hear you. You know, many are not good at finishing strong. Many do not hang in there for the long haul. For example, many get married, and, and, and at first things are, are real excited, but, but then struggles come along, and, and it's not always so easy. And many give up once on the marriage as, as soon as things start getting tough. There are many that, that, that give up on Christ when things might get tough in their life. Yes, they come to faith in Christ. Yes, they're baptized into Christ. They stick with Jesus for a little while, but when difficult times come, many just do not endure for Christ. Many struggle with a certain temptation and they end up leaving Christ going back to the world. Many give up and do not finish strong. But one who trusts and has faith in the Lord perseveres to the finish line. Paul was about to cross the finish line of his journey with Christ. He was going to finish well or finish strong. Paul was, was one who, was pers who persecuted the, the uh, church and then preached Christ. He went through persecution uh, for preaching Christ and living for Christ. Spent time in a prison cell for being a Christian. Can you imagine what Paul's prison cell would have been like? Nothing like today's prisons. I doubt he had a window. I, I didn't doubt he didn't, you know he didn't have running water. Probably slept on the floor. Didn't have a toilet. Doubt he didn't get to work out and get his three meals a day. He had a bathroom, probably had to do that in his cell. Paul labored for Christ and his time was coming to an end. Paul was confident of how he lived his life and assured of his future home in heaven. I encourage us to finish strong like Paul. Let's look at this passage. You see Paul's view of dying and the offering. I am already being poured out as an offering or a drink offering. Poured out, it could, be, could refer uh, to his expectation of his death. He knows he's going to face a, a bloody death. Possibly Paul can see a beheading. Even though death was imminent for Paul, he still possessed courage in the face of death. He knew that death would just transfer him from one side of eternity to the next. He knew that to be absent from the body is to what? Be present with who? The Lord, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Poured out as a drink offering. Now in Numbers 15, 1 through 10, speaks of wine being poured out over a sacrifice to the Lord. And the word offered was a word uh, used for offering a sacrifice to a God. Leon Barnes from Little Rock writes, The Romans would end their meals by offering something like a glass of wine to the gods. And Paul is saying, My life is not being taken from me. I offer it as a sacrifice or an offering to God. Paul knows that God is the one who gave him all things, especially salvation from sin. And Paul was willing and ready to lay down his life for God. Paul lived his life as a living sacrifice, taught us how we're to live holy and pleasing lives to God, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. And not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our hearts and minds. Paul was willing to lose his life for the sake of Christ. For the Christian today, we shouldn't be afraid to lose our life for the sake of Christ. John 14, Jesus tells us, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of someone who can kill our body. We should fear the Lord and Him only. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be afraid to stand up for Jesus. May we have the courage to stand up for Christ when others might deny Him. Paul desired to glorify and honor the Lord in life or in death. If you read Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20, the Bible says, According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul, more than anything, 
in his life or in his death, wanted the name of Jesus to be exalted or magnified. Can that be said of our life? Think about our lives for a second. Is Jesus being glorified by the way I use my, or, or, the way I use my speech, the way I'm talking in front of others, and the way I talk to others? Is Jesus being glorified by the things that we, we share on Facebook or whatever, social media site? Is Jesus being glorified by the things that we watch on television or the things we listen to? Something to think about. In all our lives, let's continue to be a living sacrifice to be more like Jesus. Paul said that his departure was near or at hand. Paul's life or work as an evangelist, is, it's coming to an end. He would soon lose his life or die for the cause of Christ. Now, the word departure here is, is related to a ship that is about to pull up the anchor and it's about to depart, okay? A man named John Gill wrote these words. An allusion to the Israelites going out of Egypt and marching for Canaan's land. This world being like Egypt, a place of wickedness, misery, and bondage, as heaven, like Canaan, a place and state of rest and happiness. Albert Barnes would write these words, The true idea of death is that of loosening the bands that confine us to the present world, of setting us free and permitting the soul to go forth, as with expanded sails on its eternal voyage, with such a view of death, why should a Christian fear to die? For Paul to depart, it was like setting sail for another land or, or somewhere better. Now, don't we do that with vacations? Don't we leave the everyday work and the grind of, the, of, of our hometowns and, then, and, we, and we go to places like we go to Disney World, right? Anybody want to go to Disney? I do. Uh, my wife won't let me go this year. But anyway, we go to Gulf Shores or we go snow skiing or we, we go to the lake or wherever. Paul's parting gives us an image of what death is for the Christian. It's, it's a journey to a place that's free from temptation. It's free from sin and suffering and death. Revelation 21, 1 through 4 talks about that, how, you know, place of, heaven is a place of no mourning, no sorrow, no sadness, no death, you know. You know the, the former things have passed away. We know those former things. We know suffering. We know death. We know temptations. So I'm look forward to when I'm in heaven, I'm not going to be tempted again. Anybody else with, with me on that? But I had a friend named Danny Jones down in Sardis Lake Christian Camp said, sin is a storm that is never ending when it comes to temptation. We're always going to be bothered by Satan until the, our last breath. But anyway, Paul knew that for him to live for Christ, that he would gain in death. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain, Philippians 1 and 21. He also knew to depart and be with Christ was far better than what the world offers. Sadly, many of us as Christians were too attached to the world, thinking this world has more to offer than Christ. And our, but our minds need to be on things above more than things below. See, Paul's precious memories. In verse 7, Paul had, it says, uh, he fought the good fight. You know, when our time comes to an end and we look back in the rearview mirror of our lives, what will we look back and say? Oh, I wish I spent more time on the golf course, which I like to play golf. Uh, I wish I spent more time fishing and deer hunting, and more time at the office. No, those things, those things don't matter. They're fun, but they don't matter. You know, living for God and fighting the good fight of faith are, is what we should be about from day to day. And when I look back on my time on earth, I hope I can say that I fought the good fight of faith like Paul said. Stephen Cole wrote these words. Paul is using an athletic metaphor, either of a wrestling match or a race. And it conveys that the Christian life is not a Sunday school picnic, but rather a struggle against the forces of evil. It's not just any fight, it's the good fight. The fight of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Folks, the, the Christian life is not just a Sunday school picnic. It's not peachy. It's not always a bed of roses. Okay? The Christian life is a fight against the evil one. Paul tells us you need to put on the full armor of God so you can stand up against the devil's schemes. Listen to Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. You've heard this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, he says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all taking the shield of faith with which you can be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The devil is going to come at us with all his might. He, know, he throws all kinds of temptations at us, including the kitchen sink. Are we prepared for battle? Are we turning to God for help and strength to overcome? Fighting the good fight of faith can also mean that we've, we've done our best. We try to give our best in all areas of life, don't we? We teach our kids, uh, you know, do the best that you can, especially in the classroom. I know you're not always going to make 100. You're not always going to be perfect every time. But do the best you can. I want my daughter Emery to, to do her best when she steps out there on the softball field. I know she's not going to hit the ball every time. She's not going to catch every ground ball that comes her way. But I want her to give her coach the best. I want my little six-year-old Garner to, to uh, give his best in baseball, especially this weekend. He's traveling to Ruston, Louisiana tomorrow to play in a six-year-old World Series. When I was six... I, I wasn't playing in a World Series. He is. But whatever he does in life, I want him to give him his all. I try to give my best to my wife, Jamie. I fail her from time to time. We give our heart to God. There are times we're going to fail him. All of us have missed the mark. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. Paul didn't say, for y'all have sinned. He said, for all have sinned. We missed the mark, but I still want a clean heart. David prayed, creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51.10. And I want my heart on things above. Colossians 3.1-4. Paul gave God his best. He had his shortcomings. Referred to himself as the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15. No matter what, he still focused on God. Philippians 3.12-14. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold on me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. And I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You've probably heard the expression, you can't keep a good man down. Paul got knocked down. He had his sins. He, he committed sins. But he didn't stay down. He was determined to reach forward and to keep on going. And may we ask God to be with us as we give him our best from day to day. Fought the good fight of faith. He finished the race. Paul didn't drop out. He was about to complete his journey or his race. Paul is referring to a long race. There are many who run marathons. Or anybody in here ever run a marathon? There's no crazy people in here. One here? Okay. Watched one on TV once. I hear you. 26.2 miles. Long way. Came, came across something interesting about a marath the word marathon. The word marathon comes from a geographic place where a, a decisive battle took place uh, between Greece and Persia in 490 B.C. The legend is that after the battle, a Greek soldier ran the distance from Marathon to Athens, which was 21 to 25 miles, depending on his route, with the news of victory, and then he fell dead. That's why I don't run a marathon. I don't want to run and fall dead. But, but based on the legend, the modern marathon race began between Marathon and Athens in the 1896 Olympics and was lengthened to the present 26.2 miles in the 1908 Olympics. The Christian race. I've seen many, and you probably have as well, have seen many drop out of the race over the years. We've seen those start well, but they don't finish well. Paul compares the Christian life to a race or a marathon in 1 Corinthians 9, 
24 to 26. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, he says. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Like I said, I've never run a marathon. I, I have a youth minister friend that runs in half marathons all the time. The lady who won the Little Rock Marathon last year's daughter is in my daughter's class at the academy. Uh, but there's no easy marathons. The Christian life is not easy. If someone tells you the Christian life's easy, don't listen to them, okay? You know, they're probably not living right. Christian life's hard. We face trials. We face tribulations. We face discouragement. We face, we face good times. We face bad times. We're not always going to be on the mountaintop. There's going to be those valleys. But there's joy in sticking with Jesus, no matter how difficult life gets. We can either look to Jesus or we can allow sin to tangle us up from day to day. I pray we focus on Him so we can look back and say what Paul said, I finished the race. May we finish well. Finally, the Bible says, well, not finally, but next year, we, Paul said he kept the faith. There in, through all that Paul had faced in his life, difficulties, dangers, and temptations, he kept his faith in God. Confessed his faith in God, lost his life for the sake of the gospel, kept it to the end. Knew something better was coming his way. Put his faith in Jesus, lived by his truths, lived by faith in the Son of God. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. He'd been true to God. He kept his faith when even others abandoned. You see, in 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, it talks about how Hymenaeus and Philetus uh, wandered away from the faith. And also in 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20, talks how some, including Hymenaeus and Alexander, rejected or have shipwrecked their faith. And then you read in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, talks about how Demas fell in love with the present world and he deserted Paul. To keep the faith means to observe and to follow the truths found in Scripture. The Bible, for example, it, it teaches us to, to have a clean heart, to have a pure mind. Well, how can one have a clean heart or a pure mind when they spend most of their time lusting after the opposite sex? That's not having faith or following what the Bible teaches. That's, that's being selfish. The truth is that the heart of sin is the letter I. I do what I want. I want to please myself. I'm selfish. We live in a selfie world, right? People taking selfies all the time, aren't they? But y'all want to take one real quick? Yeah. No, okay. Um, we don't know how. I read a story that happened back in the early 90s, excuse me, 80s, about an Olympic sprinter, Ben Johnson. He, he uh, used steroids. He was stripped of his gold medals. Didn't learn his lesson. Suspended for two years and caught doing steroids and drugs again in 1993 and banned for life. Selfish. Paul never took shortcuts. Paul sinned, but he never veered off God's course. He kept pressing on. He kept his faith in Christ and sought after the ways of the Spirit. And may we keep holding on to the words of Christ. Let's follow them wholeheartedly. And finally, as we come to an end here, we see our last point, Paul's wonderful hope. Paul was looking forward to what was next. He was looking forward to being with his Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. He looked forward to standing before the Lord and receiving the crown of life, or the, the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness symbolizes victory for the faithful. The Greek word for crown, stephanos, is the wreath or the garland which was given as a prize to victors in the games according to Thayer. Thayer goes on to write, metaphorically, the eternal blessedness which will be given as a prize to the genuine servants of God in Christ. The crown, the wreath, which is the reward of the righteous. Paul speaks about the crown of life. James, excuse me, James talks about it. James 1 and 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. Jesus speaks of those who are faithful to death will receive the crown of life. Revelation 2.10. When will we receive this crown? On that day, Paul writes. 
the day of judgment, a day or an appointment we all must face. The crown of life, sadly, is not going to be given to all. It shoots down the doctrine of universalism where everyone's going to be saved. Now, God wants everyone to be saved. He's patient with us. It's His desire that all be saved, but not all are going to come to Him. There are many who could care less about the Christian life and about God, and especially when He comes a second time. But those who have loved, those who have longed for His appearing are believers in Christ. The same hope and the same reward that Paul received is one that God's children will receive. Isn't that wonderful news, church? Many think there's no way God can forgive me. There's no way God can save me or give me a home in heaven. That's the wrong attitude, church. If God can save the chief of sinners, he can save and reward us as well. Heaven is not just for spiritual giants mentioned in Scripture. All of us can be rewarded with heaven if we follow the Master. Every time a little boy went to his friend's house, he found his friend's grandmother was deeply absorbed in studying and reading her Bible. And then the little boy asked his friend, he said, why does your grandmother read her Bible so much? His friend said, I'm not real sure, but I think it's because she's cramming for her finals. Okay? Cramming for finals. Stephen Cole writes, he, talking about Paul, he lived in view of that day when he would stand before Christ, and so should we. The fact that we will stand before the Lord, the righteous judge, on that day should motivate us to live righteously on this day. Paul was one who started strong as we come to a, clo a closing tonight and finished the Christian race strong. Paul didn't drop out, kept on walking with Christ. There are times in life we've probably wanted to quit. Don't quit. Finish strong. Don't give up and miss out on heaven for some earthly pleasures. You've probably heard that quote, don't miss heaven for the world. One day it'll be worth it all. There's an old hymn that, that reads, it says this, It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. One author says, Determine today that you will be a soldier of the Lord who can look back one day and be proud of the fight you fought, the race you run, and the faith you kept. A soldier with no regrets. To all God's soldiers in here, there are truly no regrets in Jesus. I truly believe that. As a Christian, have you quit on Jesus? As a Christian, are you lukewarm? As a Christian, is your faith strong or have you allowed it to diminish? Maybe you need prayers of the church tonight. For those in here who don't know Christ, He's the Son of God who died for your sins and mine. He rose from the grave and asked us to come to Him. Matthew 11, 28-30. Will you come to Him? Will you trust in His words? Will you confess Him as Lord and be baptized, repent and be baptized into Christ to have your sins washed away? Will you keep walking with Him in the light from day to day? God loves you and I love you and let's all go to heaven together. If you need to come to Jesus, I ask you to come as together we stand and sing a song of encouragement tonight. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how He loves me, how I love Him. He is